Our first uh, guest doesn't have much time for art wankers, and yet he pumps millions of dollars into his very own art museum, the wonderful Museum of Old and New Art, or Mona in Hobart. David Walsh is a multimillionaire gambler from the working-class Hobart suburb of Glenorchy, and he's just released his memoir, and it's a very smart, very generous read. You never know what's around the corner. As you read through this, it's a very, and uh, well, it's a gorgeous volume to hold in your hand. It's, it's gilded. That's the word. And it's called a bone effect. Nice to be talking to you again, David. Hello there. I can understand why you'd want to publish a book that looks so lovely, but it's also very intimate. I mean, it is very revealing. You reveal family secrets and very personal stories from your past. What, what's made you decide to let us in in this way? Why you write a book is an interesting question, but you're asking me why I wrote this specific book. I had a moment a couple of years ago where I was... Walter Isaacson that wrote about Steve Jobs was asked why Steve wanted it done and he was obviously terminally ill at the time and he was thinking apparently that he wanted to get down on paper stuff that his kids needed to know about him, a bit of a warts and all sort of thing and I thought that's pretty sweet. you know. But I wondered why he didn't do it himself. Maybe he didn't do it himself because he didn't think it would be real enough. It's very hard to write about yourself without inter- interjecting bias. I'm definitely biased, so, but I thought the overview with the bias might be interesting. So I try to write about myself and then look at why I'm writing and how I'm writing and what I'm thinking and then be a bit snide and a bit, you know, you took, mentioned before in the intro that I've not got much time for art wankers, and that's true. And in, and I definitely am one. Like, Well, yes. So I it's, it's, in some ways you it's are. a process of pulling yourself apart. Yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't really understand yourself by twiddling your thumbs. Yeah, well, you've done it in a very public way, and I, I love this book. I mean, it jumps around in all sorts of marvellous ways. So you talk about why you're a vegetarian. Then there's a, <laughs> there's a long discussion on slime mould. We learn about the survival tactics of penguins. There's a very nice story about getting covered in the poo of a hooker sea lion on a trip to Antarctica. And then you write this. I believe that if there's one thing that makes my thinking different from most... It's my natural proclivity to see the ghosts of possible pasts having an impact on the present. Can we talk about that? What, what do you mean by the ghosts of possible pasts? We tend to see history as inevitable. Whatever led to the present happened. So we tend to say, this is the world as it was. It had to be this way. And perhaps it didn't. Perhaps we are one small microcosm of a huge number of possible outcomes that could have generated a huge number of possible presents. And there is probability involved. We are the outcome of good or bad fortune. And one of the things I think about all the time in relation to myself, because let's face it, I got pretty lucky in by most of the measures that are used, at least the commercial measures that are used to evaluate a life. So I got a few bucks. And um, one of the things that rich people tend to say is they tend to say that they deserve, they worked hard, you know, they made good decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And they probably did. A lot of that was good fortune. I like to see asymmetry in appraisal. So no one is totally a self-made man. I don't think so. And I think the people that would be described as unsuccessful tend to think they're unlucky. Yeah. The sort of people that describe themselves as successful tend to think that they're skilled. Yeah, brilliant. But Hard there working. has to be symmetry there, right? Yeah. This this much misfortune needs to be compensated by this much fortune. One of these two groups is wrong. The much lar- larger group is the unfortunate group. So surely they're more likely to be right. Yeah. You know, like, and as from the quote you talk about, you know, this meta level, me looking at the ghosts of things that could have happened. Like, you know, I might, I might be one of these people lying in a gutter, or I might have had a tumor strike me down. I think that the way I happened to make money, which was gambling, taught me about the nature of fortune and misfortune. So once you get a system together, as as we did, that works, yeah, we're going to keep winning most likely. Yeah. But to alight on a winning system in the first place, to have the good fortune, to have the you know to meet the right guys at the right time, I had no ambitions in this area at all. I reckon the other thing your book's about, apart from luck and the way in which it determines the yeah, the chances that we take in life or the things that are the outcomes of our own lives, is is this question of what can we know? Because you talk about the devastating impact that the Catholic faith had on your 
parents' marriage. In fact, there's a kind of scene set, a story that you tell, and on your relationship with your own dad. Can you tell us about that? Well, in terms of the my relationship with my dad, probably in the book, comes across as more important than I think it is. One of the things that happens when you write a book is once it's crystallised, it becomes real. The ghost of the sentences you could have written are gone. Like, I didn't spend a lot of time with my dad. My parents broke up when I was two. Arguably, he was a bit of a bastard. You know, he, was, he was definitely violent towards my mum. That was preceded by both of my parents having had a previous marriage. I've never heard the story from either of them, and they're both dead now, so I'll never know what happened. In fact, mum denied, denied that she was married previously, but my birth certificate says otherwise. But anyway, Catholic guilt got her. She returned to her, the faith of her youth, and then a particular priest told her that their marriage couldn't be consummated anymore because... You know, they, were, they had a they prior had marriage. Previous was, marriage. Yeah. So there was so no, he's, he's no sex. They had to live, the line yeah, is they had to so, live together as brother and sister. So as I understand it, Dad went crazy. I only ever heard this from, a, from an aunt. Like, So, you know, this is, it's, it's become fact. It's become a bone of fact, but it is really a bone of contention. Is it real? I don't know. But certainly there were issues in my parents' Marriage that haunted me for years. Didn't spend a lot of time with my dad. I was always excited to see him. We, yeah. I would go and see him every second Wednesday, I think it was. And, you know, he did things like buy me Kentucky Fried Chicken. We didn't have any money, so that was pretty exciting. <laughs> there you go. But but am I wrong in, in reading the book as questioning why people would get involved in religion? Because you are a guy who values science, who values well, I th- reason. Well, I, I, I think the way we create wisdom, the way we create knowledge, perhaps more specifically, is by having personal opinions that tend to be outrageous and wrong, but we believe them. And then they come up against doubt and a methodology, you know, we call scientific method now, that's been applied throughout history in various ways that produces a consensus that it's far more likely to be right than, you know. The idea is to have an idea and to have an opinion and to sit around and espouse it and talk this sort of rubbish that I'm talking now, but to be aware that you're most most likely wrong. Yeah. Most belief systems, whether they involve a God or not, you know, whether they involve a God or an expensive private school education, tend to make you think you're right about everything. I've seen surveys of where people at random are asked questions and the answer to the question is is barely relevant, what is interesting is the follow-up in these surveys where they say, what is the probability that you were right about that question? Who's the President of the United States? Yeah. Barack Obama. What is the probability that you're right? 100%, right? There you go. It turns out that when, you're, when you think you're 100% right, and these are things that crystallise out to facts, not opinions, you're much less likely to be right about an opinion, you are about 80% likely to be right. So that's you know, it's a, a, a very interesting way of gauging the reality of reality in terms of human opinion. And people, including myself, are told these facts, and maybe they're not a fact, maybe I'm misremembering yeah. the details of the analysis, but they're told th- these snippets of information and they're, for example, told that memory is faulty. We know how faulty memory is, but we think, for example, that when we remember something, if we're old enough, the day John Kennedy died or 9-11, that we remember that. Accurately. But we don't. don't, Our memory is just as faulty with that, but the thing that happens is that the, because we're sure we're right about these things, there's a bigger gulf between our opinion and reality. Look, we've got to stop, but I don't want to stop without asking you something quite intimate. And that's about the impact that running Mona has had on you. Because, I mean, this is a very personal thing to say to you, but I get the impression that when you started, you were pretty defensive about all this. You know, you had a bit of sort of attitude to you. You you can all get stuffed. I don't care whether you like it or not. You've become gentler. I am the system now. I am the establishment. Yes, it's, it's it's a very strange process. This is the first time I've ever been in a radio studio, for example. You know, I can't... Imagine the the changes that have been wrought over me by being forced, by being told by publicists we need a front person. 
I ran a small museum before. Nobody noticed. Nobody. The people that came seemed to like it, but we didn't generate a crowd. So we had to generate a crowd that made me a public persona. And I'm, you know, I have an essentially autistic personality. When I was 20, Jelko, my gambling partner, asked me to book a hotel room for him. And it took me like six tries to pick up the phone to make a call, you know. And tonight I'm doing some publicity thing for my book, as I'm doing here, for, you know, to 600 people. So these changes happen to you. And as I, this is, gets back to the ghost of possible past. This is a very unlikely present for me, but a, mm. but a very, very joyous one. And I've certainly learned something about myself. You can't keep saying to people that say, I really like your museum. You can't keep saying, piss off. <laughs> no, you, you know, can't. It's, it, I don't it, give a stuff what you think. Like, <laughs> if you can come up with one smart-ass remark is useful, but you just can't come up with a thousand, you know. Yeah, yeah. So eventually you've got to be nice. It, it, it's an education I never expected to have. I'm definitely not the person that I thought I'd be in 10 years, 10 years ago. And one of the things I often think about is why not just eliminate the middle person and say, I'm not going to believe in 10 years what I believe now, so let's just not believe it now. Right. And move on. Well, thank you for being such a sweet man and coming into our studio. I know it pains you to hear that, but I'm sure it brings you joy deep in your heart. Thank you for letting me peddle my book on the ABC. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe to our free newsletter. Sign up at the RN homepage. 